So you've decided to homeschool. Now what? I remember when I first started homeschooling and I ordered my material from the back of a women's magazine and waited for that box to arrive and the whole time I was waiting for that box I was second guessing myself wondering if I was really qualified to do this. What made me think I could do this? And that box came and I had all of those books in the middle of my kitchen floor and I just sat there and cried. I was so overwhelmed. And my children were in a conventional school setting already. I had two who were, they were in a um, gifted and talented program at school. And all I could think of was, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to provide the challenges that they are uh, being exposed to in school. I won't be able to provide those opportunities. I had one who had uh, been born with some learning challenges, some physical challenges as well, and I was concerned that she was going to be labeled, and if she was in special needs classes, was I going to be able to meet those needs for her? So I had both ends of the spectrum there, and all I could think of was, oh my goodness, what made me think that I could do this? But I want to welcome you here today as we speak, because um, you can do this. I'm here to encourage you. You know, when we started homeschooling, I spent those first few weeks just panicked that we were going to be up till 10 o'clock at night every night trying to finish all of this material. And it didn't work out that way. We were able to find a rhythm and within a few weeks you know, we were being able to finish those things by around lunchtime because uh, that one-on-one -on -one was just such a more efficient way to learn than what they'd been doing in a class situation. But by the end of the year, I just couldn't imagine having done anything any differently. And in uh, all of those years, we never looked back and thought, we wish we'd done anything any differently. So um, I'm Vicki Bentley. Uh, I'm uh, author and speaker, uh, homeschool consultant. But what I really want you to think of me as is wife and mom and grandma and great grandma and homeschool friend. So my husband and I have eight daughters and uh, so far 23 grandchildren and our sixth great grandbaby is due this fall as of the time of this uh, recording but you can also find me at everyday homemaking online uh, you can find me at homeschool with confidence i'm on facebook at everyday homeschooling as well i do have a background as an education consultant with a state organization as well as a national organization but really i'm just a homeschool mom i'm a homeschool parent like you so in this, uh, this workshop, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can homeschool with confidence. Took a survey uh, in the past year and asked veteran homeschooling parents, what are some of the things they're most afraid of in homeschooling? What worries them? And some of the things that they were most concerned about were things such as, what if I don't do a good job? Or what if I don't give my kids a good education? Or what if I ruin my kids? Or what if they don't know how to take a test? So a lot of the same things you're probably thinking of right now. So I'm here just to encourage you. Uh, you may be starting at kindergarten. Some of you may just be looking at getting started to begin with. Some of you may be looking at taking a child out of a conventional school situation. So whether you're dealing in the early years with preschool and primary topics, or maybe you haven't always homeschooled, you're starting a few years in. I know you're going to have a lot of questions. You're probably wondering, can you really switch to homeschooling midstream? What does homeschooling look like? Where do you even begin? What do you expect? How can you ease this transition for everybody involved? So we're going to cover those topics and more. And uh, again, we started homeschooling when several of my children had already been in public school for several years. We were also foster parents later on, and we homeschooled many of our foster children on just a few days notice or even same days notice um, mid-year. And I'm still standing, silver haired, but still standing. So I want to share a few tips with you. So I know a lot of this workshop is going to sound like drinking water from a fire hose. So just it's going to be a lot of information in a short time period, but take it a little bit at a time to just swallow what you can, then revisit later on. You can listen to it again. Um, I have a lot more information for you in our workshops, at my site, uh, in our Home Education 101 mentoring program for you, and at our membership community. So hopefully you can find your homeschool tribe. But the first thing you want to do is you want to research homeschooling. You want to know the legal requirements for your state. If you're a member of HSLDA, then you have personal access to the legal staff for your state. Uh, uh, for a lot of you, it will be contacting your state organization because they'll have information for you as well. So you want to research homeschooling, read everything you can. A lot of information for you online right now. Um, Home Education 101 is a mentoring class. Uh, we'll go into more detail on that later for you. 
at my site at Everyday Homemaking under the homeschooling section, which is Homeschool with Confidence. You can find a list of some of my favorite homeschool books and on our social media pages as well. And we're adding to that site all the time. So you want to catch a vision as well. I would like to put that first, but sometimes you don't really catch a vision for homeschooling until you've done some of the research, after you've done some of the reading. So why are you choosing to homeschool? What is your idea of a good education? And a lot of the choices that you make then for your curriculum, for your extracurricular activities and things like that are going to be based on that vision. Your why is going to impact your how. So we have a lot of articles for you uh, by dads. There are books. There's a lot of things to help you, whether you're um, mom, dad, working together, single parent, a lot of resources for you. A lot of times we have grandparents who are now um, homeschooling grandchildren as well. So we have a lot of tools for you. Do you want to have some goals? Your goals should be measurable and attainable. And we have some goals sheets for you at the site. But you're probably thinking, what do I include? I don't even know how to set goals. So the first thing you want to do then is start with a plan. As you're setting goals, start with a plan. Regardless of your children's ages or your homeschooling style, it's important to have a plan. Some of you may think, well, I'm kind of loosey-goosey, or some of you may be a little more structured. That's okay. You're still going to have a plan of some sort. You want to set some goals, determine what you want to accomplish for the rest of the year, and then you're going to select materials and activities to help meet those goals. So if you need some personal guidance, um, you can contact me for one-on-one -on -one consultation. Your state organization may have consultants as well, and so does HSLDA. And, you know, just connect with your local support group as well. And we'll talk about that, about that in more detail in a little bit. But from a practical perspective, think of homeschooling as a journey, kind of a long road trip. Um, I am incredibly geographically challenged, so I like to think of this whole um, journey analogy here because it's really helpful for me because I spend so much of my regular life lost. Um, I didn't want to spend a, lo a lot of time in my homeschooling life lost, so if you think of homeschooling as a journey, then your curriculum, which most of you are probably most panicked over, your curriculum is your course of study or your roadmap or your directions. So if you're asking me for help with curriculum is kind of like asking for directions. So if I were to call you in my perpetually lost state and say, oh, so-and-so, I am so lost. I need help. I need directions. You're probably going to want to know two things. Where are you and where are you, where are you trying to go? So you need to know the same things in homeschooling. Where are you starting from and where are you trying to go? So you want to know where your child is right now. And we do have a lot of information for you on the internet, on placement tests. There are skills checklists. We go into a lot of detail on this in our uh, choosing curriculum section in Home Education 101. But there are a lot of evaluative tools for you. There's also baseline testing. And that can often be very important. Um, if you go to HSLDA's website, you can find information on testing. We've got it at Homeschool with Confidence as well. But the baseline testing can be really important because uh, some of you may be in a state that requires you to show evidence of progress. Even if that's not the case, you're probably going to want to assess your child's progress for the year one way or another. And progress is how far you've come. Well, you don't know how far you've come if you don't know where you started. So providing some kind of baseline testing, whether it's a standardized achievement test, a skills checklist, or an evaluation of some sort. That can be really a really helpful thing for you to do as soon as you are beginning to homeschool. No pressure. Nobody needs to see it. It's totally just for your information. But it can give you then that baseline when you're checking back at the end of the year to see, hey, you know, how are we doing? If you're not sure where you're headed, because that will tell you where you're starting from. If you're not sure where you're headed, if you need help with understanding what's age appropriate, what's developmentally appropriate, then we have an article for you called What Should I Be Teaching? Again, a lot of helpful sites for you online. I'm sure you'll uh, be doing lots of research and you'll find some other posts as well. I add a lot of posts regularly. HSLDA's website has a lot of help for you, as uh, does probably your state organization. But if you need help with that, we do have um, in that What Should I Be Teaching uh, article, we do have a list of 
scope and sequence checklists or basic skills guidelines that you don't need to go by. Please don't feel like you have to be in bondage to those lists because uh, every child learns differently, but it can give you a starting point. It can help you see some of the milestones that the typical student might hit at each grade level in the four major subject areas of math, language, social studies, and science. And really, the two that you're most concerned about are going to be math and language because those are skills subjects. Some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, I wasn't planning on having to do that. What is this going to cost me? It doesn't have to cost a lot. You can actually homeschool with a library card. So we have an article for you called, What Does It Cost to Homeschool? And we go into a lot more detail again in Home Education 101. But for a starter program, you might consider, for example, a basic combination could cost you under 100 bucks. Um, something along the lines of, again, this is just an example, Learning Language Arts Through Literature from Common Sense Press which is basically all of language arts in one book, lesson planned out for you, laid out for you, kind of a Charlotte Mason approach. Um, combine that with a math program such as Making Math Meaningful from Cornerstone Curriculum uh, or something along those lines. You're looking at about $85 right there. If you were to add some library books for science and social studies using those skills checklists, then you're spending less than $100 for a year's curriculum. If you have younger children, uh, the three R's of learning from uh, Ruth Beechick covers math, language, and reading for kindergarten to about third grade. If you threw in five in a row, which is a unit study approach based on classic kids books, Caldecott and Newberry award-winning library books, then you're spending maybe $50, $60, uh, and you have your curriculum from kindergarten to third grade. So again, doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. Another place for some nice um, uh, everyday living types of things, master books, math lessons for a living education, language lessons for a living education, add those library books, and you've got a solid program. Now, as you're looking at curriculum, couple things to keep in mind are there are a lot of different ways to approach this. Uh, there are packages where the whole package is put together for you. Some of you may prefer something a little more eclectic. You'd like to pick and choose and put some things together. I like to think of it as the combo platter at a restaurant versus ordering a la carte off the menu. Or for some of you who maybe bake, it's buying the cake, using the cake mix versus making your cake from scratch. So some of you say, just give me the cake mix. I'll, you know, it's all together. It's already pre-done for me. I just have to, you know, throw it together in the pan. Some of you say, you know, I want to, I want to know what's going in here and I want to be able to pick and choose and I want to use something different. So same thing with your homeschool curriculum. You can mix and match for an eclectic approach if you would like to. If you don't want to have to do that, you can buy a package. That's perfectly okay. You can use an online program, a lot of options. So a lot of packages, for example, um, Timberdoodle at Timberdoodle.com, My Father's World at MFWBooks.com, Heart of Dakota, Christian Liberty Academy Satellite School, um, Switched On Schoolhouse, Trail Guide to Learning, Sunlight, um, Bookshark, Charlotte Mason in a Box, I always want to say let her out. Memoria's classical approach, Bob Jones and Abeka, they all have packages for you, and that's just a starting point. Uh, if you want to mix and match, you know, well, we need a math program. What are some great math programs to start off looking at? You might want to look at Life of Fred, or Saxon, or Making Math Meaningful, or Math You See, Right Start, Schiller, Bob Jones, Horizons, Ray's Arithmetic, Teaching Textbooks, just a starting point for you, uh, or Language Arts. Okay, let's pick one out of the math one. Now let's look at one out of the Language Arts list. Learning Language Arts Through Literature is one of my favorites. Um, language Arts at Home, Queen Homeschool, Institute for Excellence in Writing, uh, Character Quality Language Arts, Rod and Staff, Language Lessons for a Living Education, Again, some great options. Tons more available, that's just a starting point for you. For social studies, Diana Waring's history, Beautiful Feet, Knotgrass, Story of the World, Streams of Civilization, 
mystery of history. Great places to begin. Throw in some science there, science in the beginning from Berean books, Rainbow, uh, Answers in Genesis, Master Books, uh, Christian Kids, Apologia. So a lot of things that you can choose from if you want to do an a la carte listing. And that's just the tip of the iceberg there. But you're going to mix and match. Now some of you would prefer to just buy the cake mix and that's okay. Some of you don't want to use the cake mix. That don't, you don't want to make it from scratch. You just want to pick up a cake at the store on the way home. So maybe you want an online program or you want to hire a tutor. I have a, a lot of online programs available for you that I can uh, tell you people who have tried these. Um, you might want to just look and see what's the best fit for you. Some of them are actually uh, live streamed. So there's uh, interaction right there in an inter interactive classroom setting. Some of them are totally archived and you just watch them at your convenience. So a nice variety there for you. Again, uh, we've got more articles for you at our site. HSLDA has a lot of articles for you. Uh, and we have um, our Facebook page at Everyday Homeschooling. So you uh, want to know a little bit more about lesson planning probably, uh, organization, check out the articles for you on the website. Again, a lot more details on those topics in Home Education 101. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, if I put this together myself, I'm afraid I'm not going to cover everything I need to cover. I'm afraid there are going to be gaps. So how many of you learned everything that you know right now by the time you were 18? Probably not raising your hand because we didn't. We continue to learn. So it's not your job to teach your child everything there is to know. It's your job to make sure your child has all of the basic skills and then gets to develop those skills and knows how to learn. So if you're afraid of gaps, again, check some of those scope and sequence guidelines, those skills checklists. I've got some lists for you at the site because uh, that'll at least let you see that you're hitting those major milestones. There's also a Brigance Diagnostic Inventory tool that HSLDA rents to members uh, that you can probably find elsewhere as well. Um, but the green book from pre-K to ninth grade can help you track those skills. So you're probably thinking, what does my child need to learn? Well, the first thing is what the state or the world or society says your child needs to learn. Those are the things you're going to find on those checklists. Those are the academics. I like to also look at, from for our family's perspective, what does God want my kids to know? Second Peter 1.5 says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Well, you can't add to faith if you didn't start with it. So I like to think of faith as the foundation, regardless of what your faith is. Faith is that foundation. And then to that, we're going to add virtue. And virtue, I like to think of as character. And then to that, we're going to add knowledge. So academics are important, but they're not number one. I had a sweet friend once who said that she was not raising her sons to get into Harvard. She was raising her sons to get into heaven. They did happen to go to Harvard as well, but, uh, but that wasn't the plan. So I have an article for you on our site called Deliberate Devotions, if that would be helpful as well. So you want to have a plan academically, but hold it loosely. Now, some of you are thinking, I don't know how to handle this. Do I go for freedom? Do I go for formality? Well, your first goal is to let your child explore the world around him. You also want to get to know your child. Now, uh, if your child has been in a conventional school situation and you're bringing him home, you're transitioning you're going to probably need to let him de-school, decompress a little bit. We'll talk about that again in a moment. But um, you're really looking toward more of a learning lifestyle. You and I only know to do what we did. And for most of us, that was a conventional school. So all we know to do is take that conventional school model and bring it home. But what I want to encourage you to do is think of learning as more of a lifestyle. So you can go to a lot of different places, read about something, you know, a day in our homeschool. You can read the accounts of a lot of different homeschooling families to get ideas and inspiration for, and encouragement that you're not alone. But one of the earliest books I ever read on homeschooling was called The Survivor's Guide to Homeschooling by, I think it was Shackelford and White. And there weren't very many homeschooling books available back then, so it was a, a big plus to be able to read this. But I remember one of the things they shared in that book was the stories of a couple different families' schedules for, or routines, their, their, uh, uh, how they handle things for the, the day and 
during the year and what days they took off and that sort of thing. And I remember thinking, wow, there's not any one right way to do this. It, it, you really do get to tailor this to your family's needs. One family, I think, dad had certain days off during the week, so the kids were able to take those days off to be with dad, and then they worked on the weekends. Nothing says you have to homeschool from 8.30 to 5. Most states aren't going to have that strict rules, but you always want to make sure that you're in compliance with your, your, um, your state regulations, of course. But there's not any one right way to homeschool. If your husband uh, comes in late at night, so you want your kids to be able to stay up, up a little bit later, and then they get up a little bit later in the morning, that's okay. You can do what works best for your family. So now some children are coming out of a conventional school, whether it's mid-year, in between, uh, you know, from grade level to grade level, they may feel more secure in that familiar structured class setting because that's what they're accustomed to, at least at first. So after a little bit of decompression or de-schooling, you can do the desk thing if you want to, or you can relax a little bit and sit at the kitchen table or the coffee table. And we have some ideas for you and tips on our website on how to incorporate learning stations into your home decor. But um, it doesn't have to look like a, a classroom. But if by formal, you know, we're thinking freedom versus formality. If by formal, you're thinking of having an outlined plan. A lot of parents feel a lot more comfortable having very specific goals. And you know, we all feel more secure with a routine of sorts. I'm not talking about the kind of schedule that has you dinging a bell to go from subject to subject, but something that gives you a rhythm or a pattern to your day. Again, lots of information for you on our site. And we have a whole section on that in our Home Ed 101 course. But I found it helpful for us. We started off with um, the same schedule that the local schools used because my children had been in a local school, we lived in a neighborhood, and that was the simplest thing. But I found that I was getting burned out really fast. So something that was helpful for me was to go eight weeks on, one week off for five cycles. Because my philosophy was I can do anything for eight weeks at a time if I know I'm getting a break. So I went eight weeks on, one week off for five cycles, then took off four weeks at Christmas time and four weeks in July. So we basically started our school year in August and then we had some extended times off during the year. So I would lesson plan. I had an overview for the year but I lesson planned on paper day by day in my lesson plan book which you can find on our website. Um, but I lesson planned day by day for only an eight week block of time. And then at the end of the eight weeks I could take that week in between to evaluate where we were compared to where I'd hoped we would be. And then I could evaluate, are we where we want to be? If we are, great. If we're not, why? Did I have unrealistic expectations? Did we piddle? Were, was some of the kids sick? What was going on? So, and keep in mind, as you're looking at all of these school things that you're building in, when you're working toward a lifestyle of learning, your everyday education, your, ed your everyday activities are educational as well. So, you're probably doing things with your kids that if they were in a school setting, they'd be getting credit for. Or if you had younger children in a Montessori setting, you'd be paying money for them to learn to do these things. So um, we'll, we'll get into more detail on that in a minute. So again, like I said before, your why is really going to influence your how. So again, we want to have reasonable expectations of your kids. When you're thinking, what do I teach? You want to make sure that you're uh, having expectations that are developmentally and age appropriate. With our primary students, with our younger kids, our main goals are to give these kids lots of physical and creative play. You want to give them lots of it, opportunities to experience things, lots of experiential learning, a lot of discovery learning. I like to think of it as letting them build hooks on which they can hang their future learning. Because you've got to remember, what looks like play to us, that's work to them. That's how they're building these brain connections. So it's important for them to have a lot of creative, physical play time. And be patient. Watch for signs of frustration in you and the kids. So uh, if it feels like you're uh, introducing something to your child and he's just getting frustrated, maybe you need to approach it a little bit differently. Maybe you need to wait another day or two or week uh, or month to introduce that. Maybe he's just not ready yet because different children 
just mature at a different rates. Some kids read when they're four. Some kids read when they're eight. It's not unusual for kids to read when they're nine or ten. Um, when they're ready, then, then they'll be able to do that. But again, with our younger kids, a lot of experiential learning and then adding more responsibility as they become more mature. How long should you be spending on homeschooling? Well, it's really going to depend. And again, if your state has specific requirements, you want to make sure that you're uh, complying with those. But again, the independent reading, independent projects, PE, um, chores, is that's home ec. So a lot of those things are things that you can be counting in your hours. If you have any questions, check with legal staff. But um, keep in mind that an hour of one-on-one -on -one is roughly the equivalent of about three hours in a school setting. So for your younger kids, spending an hour a day on more formal type of learning, more structured learning, even if it's, you know, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, uh, an hour a day is probably going to be sufficient. And then you're reinforcing that learning with educational activities. Renee and Mike Moseman have a book called The Smarter Preschooler. And I know it says preschool, but the concept is really applicable up into um, probably middle elementary. They talk about developing an intellectually stimulating environment for our kids versus an intellectually demanding environment. So again, as our children get older, our expectations are going to increase with their maturity because we do want to nurture academic excellence along with that faith and character we talked about earlier because our goal is to encourage our children to become self-motivated. Um, when my kids are very young, I'm going to spend a lot of time with them you know, I'm going to come alongside them. They're probably not reading yet. They're going to need a lot of my help. As they get a little older, once my kids can read really independently, I'm going to start working toward, which is usually probably around third grade, um, I'm going to work toward helping them to be more self-guided learners. And I'm going to try to work myself out of the job of teacher and more into the role of coach. So I want you to also think, after you've looked at your plan there academically, what's likely to sidetrack you? Because one of the things I hear from parents sometimes is, oh, I could never do this. I'm not organized enough. We well, you know, I don't think I was ever or as organized as I had to become when we started homeschooling. So you do what you've got to do. But think about what's going to sidetrack you. And for most parents, that's generally going to be household tasks. So if your home is not in some sort of order, your home school may not be either. So before academics, think about what's going to bother you. I talk to parents who say, oh my goodness, I feel like the house is closing in around me. I feel like I've got to worry about what the baby's eating off of the floor, but we've got to get math started. And you know, it's okay to take 20 minutes in the morning to um, get the beds made or make sure that the dishes got taken care of or the floor got swept. If the kids spend 20 minutes doing chores in the morning, that's okay. I like to think of it as home management training. And home management training is part of home ec. And home ec is part of homeschooling. So your kids are home with you 24-7. Things are going to happen. I saw a meme once that said, um, cleaning your house while your children are home is like brushing your teeth while you're still eating Oreos. You know, it's going to be a never-ending battle here. So your kids are there all day. They're not gone. I don't want to sound discouraging, but your kids are not gone for you to be able to have the house cleaned up and enjoy it for six or seven hours. So you're going to need a plan to stay on top of the house. Um, I am a big fan of the Everyday Family Chore System. We developed it while we were homeschooling many children, and it was helpful for us because it's very... Um, laid out for me. It's got the how to do it cards, so it was very helpful, but you can find that on our site as well. But again, establishing a workable routine will give your children security. If it's 20 minutes in the morning you've got to spend on that, that's okay. If it gets to be two or three hours every morning that you're trying to get the house in order, let me know over at Everyday Homemaking and we'll see if we can give you a hand there. But I include homemaking and home and management training information for you in our homeschooling information because some of you are thinking this is supposed to be about homeschooling. Why is she talking about homemaking? Because people don't quit homeschooling because they can't find the right math book or the right language arts program. They quit homeschooling because they're trying to do math and language and social studies and science. And meanwhile, the laundry is up to here. And dad's eating a bowl of Frosted Flakes for the fourth night in a row and a bowl he had to wash himself after he had to 
make his way to the dining room table and clear things off. And so you feel like something's got to go. And the logical thing to go then is the homeschooling. So we want to help you to stay on top of those things as much as possible. So now, um, again, we're going to go into a lot more detail in these things in our Home Ed 101 class. But as you're working with your kids, one of the neat things about homeschooling is you can be flexible. But we don't want to compromise on those basic skill subjects and character. So again, like I said, when we start out, sometimes we only know to do what we experienced. So we recreate school at home. But home education is much more than just school at home. Some of you thought you were making an education choice, but you were really making a lifestyle choice. It's a relationship of mentoring and discipling your children. It's a lifestyle of learning. So if you're bringing a child home, how is your child going to handle the change? Well, I told you some of the specifics first because a lot of times I find that parents panic if they don't have a plan. But really the first order of business when you're bringing your child home is to relax and enjoy your child. This is your family. You're a family. You're a parent. It's called homeschool. It's actually home education. Some people don't care for the term homeschool because of the school in it. Home education actually sounds a little more formal to me, but it really is about educating your children at home. So you may need to take some time to decompress. And I've actually heard a formula of it may take even up to a month per year your child has been in school. Doesn't mean you don't do anything with your children, but maybe you're taking some time to explore what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, just do some reading together, do some discovery learning. So again, education is still going to happen in the context of family. The transition for your child is not just academic. It's emotional. It's spiritual. His familiar routine his security has changed. So be patient with your child. Remember, this is new for him too, just like it is for you. He may miss his friends, his activities. He may even miss his teachers, even if he's been complaining about them. So be prepared to hear, well, that's not how Mrs. So-and-so did it. And your child may not know how to handle the freedom. He's had somebody telling him when to take out his book, when to go to the locker, when to go to the bathroom, when to change classes. So he may need you to tell him what to do to begin with, to give him some suggestions, to give him some guidance, and then work into more self-direction gradually. Now we already know that he's probably going to need to do some de-schooling. Learning how to be curious, learning how to enjoy learning for the joy of learning. But depending on the circumstances of your school removal, your why that we talked about earlier, your child may also have some healing to do. There's a lot of great resources for your family. We have some information for you at Everyday Homeschooling, um, on Facebook, or, or through our uh, membership community. Um, there are some good resources for you. You want to invest some time to become reacquainted with your child. And I know you're a great parent, and I know you've been spending time with your kids. But there's something different about having them home with you all the time. And I know the temptation when you bring your child home is to jump into those academics, especially if one of your goals is to catch up a child who's maybe been lagging a little bit scholastically. But pay attention to your child's passions, to your child's gifts and interests, his areas of strength, his areas of need. You want to help him renew his love for learning, to discover what he enjoys doing. Again, you're looking at de-schooling, you're looking at doing some healing here. So you want to have a plan but hold it loosely and make some adjustments along the way. You're also going to want to take into consideration your child's learning styles. I didn't even know what that meant until years into homeschooling. We've got some information for you on the site. Uh, again, we've got a whole section on that that we cover in Home Ed 101. So I hope you'll join us for that. But you're really looking at um, how your child takes in information most readily how your child processes that information he's taken in best. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but again, we're going to spend you know, a whole, whole sessions on it in Home Ed 101. But uh, you've probably heard of an auditory learner, a visual learner, a tactile learner, a kinesthetic learner. There are a lot of different ways to approach a lot of this. Um, there's the um, Gardner, Howard Gardner has a lot of information for you on uh, learning styles and giftedness. 
So you can check those things out through our links. But you're really looking at what is the way that my child most readily takes in information. Now, obviously, we all use all of our senses. And when you have very young ch children, they do use all of their senses. They're very multisensory. But as your kids get to be maybe six or seven, eight years old, they tend to show a preference. For example, you may have a student who doesn't seem to process information she's reading. Maybe you give her a list. And one of my kids, she had a before school checklist. And so I would say, you know, have you checked your, done your list? Those things they do before school starts, those, you know, make your bed, brush your teeth types of things. And I would look and she'd say, she done it. And I'm thinking, I know she didn't do these things. I can look at her room and tell they're not done. And I thought, she's, is she lying? Is she being lazy? What's going on here? But when I, if I would have her read each item out loud, she would say, oh, I haven't done that one yet. I haven't done that one yet. Her brain didn't process it when she just looked at it. She had to read it aloud. And this translated into her schoolwork because when she would have errors on her math work, it was just simple, uh, careless mistakes. Things where I know she knows this, but she would make a mistake. And I would say, I, uh, here, this problem is wrong. See if you can find the error and come back and we'll go back over it. And she couldn't find the error until I would say, tell me out loud, walk me through what you've done. And as soon as she started to do that, she'd say, oh, well, that's not right. And she would catch herself. And we realized she's very auditory. She needed to hear it. So that helped me know that when I introduced new material to her, it probably helped for me to go over it with her orally before I gave it to her in the book. Doesn't mean you never give your auditory child written work or that you never give your visual child auditory or oral instructions. It just means let's introduce the new material to my child in a way that's going to be simplest, easiest for her to assimilate. Then I can work on those other things. One of my children was, um, when she was about six or seven years old, was one of those kids that you just wanted to look at and say, could you please sit still for five minutes, just five minutes. And she could. She could, but she would have to use up all of her battery. My friend Diane Kraft talks about your child going to bed at night and recharging. You know, you probably don't recharge overnight, but your kids do. And so they wake up in the morning with all of their battery recharged, and they can use that battery to learn, or they can use that battery power to try really hard to do something that's not easy for them, such as sit still when they're wigglers. So we had to find ways to not use up her battery. So we would find ways for her to work with the movement. So we would give her a cush ball to squeeze. We let her pace the room while she memorized things or while she recited things. We would, uh, maybe you would put, uh, let your kids go up and down the stairs as they do their spelling words or their multiplication facts. Um, Cherie Fuller in the book Talkers, Watchers, and Doers talks about a conventional school teacher who had a, um, a very busy little boy who tended to, um, to be easily distracted and then, of course, then easily distracting. And so she put an exercise bike in the back of the room and she told him when he felt antsy that he should get up and he could go back and get on the exercise bike. And so one day he was having a moment and he got up and he went back to the exercise bike and as he started pedaling, and she was talking up front, as he started pedaling, he suddenly said, oh, I can hear you now. And for those of us who don't process that way, this is such a foreign thought. But anyway, the same child who had to move, when she was in about eighth grade, she got interested in dance. Now, for those of you who have children in dance, you probably know that eighth grade isn't the best time to get a child involved in ballet because she's in class with a bunch of four-year-olds, but she was committed, so she did, and by the end of the year, she was in a more advanced class, and by the end of the next year, in a much more advanced class, and within a year or so, she was student teaching at the dance studio, and by the time she graduated, she was assistant director of the studio. And as an adult mom, with four little boys, um, as an adult mama, then she uh, is a dance instructor. She owns a dance, uh, dance studio. And so uh, God made her to move. And we could have squelched that by telling her when she was six years old, you have to sit still. A friend of mine had a son who used to string strings on everything he would uh, take yarn and go from item to item. He would wrap cords around things. He always found, had ribbons. He always had something wrapping around something else. 
And as he got older and this continued, uh, he was about 15 years old and she was a little concerned that he wasn't really progressing as she, she would like him in school. He was a really smart kiddo, but he wasn't really applying himself really well. And they had an electrician come to the house when he was about 15. And when this electrician came, this young man was asking some really good questions. Such good questions that the electrician said, well, will you be 16? Because when you're 16, I'd love for you to come apprentice with me. So when he turned 16, um, he started apprenticing with this electrician. And about this time, a whole bunch of other things started to gel with him. And he said, oh my goodness, there's a lot of things I need to get done before I graduate. And he, suddenly he accomplished all of these things in these last few years that his mom had been wanting him to do, going back to when they're ready, they'll get it done. Not saying wait till they're 15 to do anything, just saying, don't panic. But anyway, this uh, young man apprenticed with this electrician and went on then to, uh, uh, to university. And someday I'm going to remember to ask him what his degree is in. But it's basically in the aeronautics field, then he is involved in um, some sort of computer programming and software development in the aeronautics field. It's the computer aeronautics equivalent of stringing strings. God made him to see connections. And his mom could have squelched that when he was little by telling him to put the string down and sit down and do his work. I'm telling you this because if you don't get anything else out of the session, I want you to recognize that what your child does, there may be, maybe he doesn't do this, but there may be something that your child does that drives you absolutely bonkers. It's something he does without even knowing he's doing it. He's, it's not a conscious thing on his part. He's not trying to annoy you. It just happens. That's probably what God has put in that child to accomplish what he wants him to accomplish. Your job is to help develop that. So we do have an article for you called Finding the Gift in Your Child that I hope will be an encouragement for you. But so again, looking at learning styles, and we'll spend an entire session on that in Home Education 101. But that'll give you an idea of the kinds of things you're looking for in your curriculum. So then you want to connect. On the social front, local support groups can be a huge help for you to provide social opportunities because a lot of times you're thinking, I'm taking a kid out of school, I don't want him to be a hermit. So don't get overwhelmed with extracurricular activities, but there are a lot of support groups available for you that offer a variety of things, everything from field trips to classes to clubs. Just be selective. You don't have to be involved in everything. Another thing that a lot of uh, groups do is they offer support for the parents. Um, my local group has a mom's night out once a month where the moms just get together. We uh, offer other things during the year. We have other opportunities for the kids to get together and families, but once a month we concentrate on the moms. So uh, you can, through your state organization or through HSLDA, you can find uh, local groups in your area. So I just want to hit six highlights for you of some basic tips for you. Uh, kind of some six tips for success type of thing. Okay, number one. You want to eliminate those frustrations as much as you can. We talked about the things that are going to bother you, uh, whether it's needing the beds to be made when you get started, making sure that the dishes get done, uh, whatever it may be. Eliminate those frustrations so that you can start your day fresh. Second thing is have realistic expectations of your children. Developmentally appropriate, age appropriate expectations. The third thing is to have realistic expectations of yourself. When you order your curriculum, the super parent cape doesn't come with it. Super mom, super dad cape doesn't come with it. Memoria Press has a cool little cape for the kids, but it's not a superwoman cape. So be realistic. You're still a parent. You've got a lot of learning to do. And some of you may feel when you start homeschooling that Everybody knows what they're doing but you. Maybe you go to a support group meeting and you're scared to ask a question because you don't want to look like you're the only one who doesn't know. It feels like everybody knows the language. Everybody understands their child's learning style and you can't figure yours out. Everybody knows what material to use. Everybody else seems to be able to get dinner on the table the same day they homeschool and you can't figure out why you're still eating cereal. So have you ever started a new job? When you start a new job, even if it's a field you're familiar with, suddenly you're in this new environment Everybody knows the routine. Everybody else knows how to log in. Everybody else seems to understand when all the breaks are. Everybody else seems to know how to back up their systems. 
Um, I worked at a job once where every week for the first three weeks, I had to call the person who had the job before me who no longer worked for our company and ask him how to back up the system until I got smart and wrote it down. But um, after a while of working at a new job, you get into a rhythm. So you suddenly realize, hey, I did that without asking anybody else. Oh, I did a pretty good job with that, or I'm a lot faster than I used to be. And it'll be the same thing with homeschooling. Next thing you know, you're going to be in a rhythm and you'll think, ah, oh, I can't even remember what it was like before we homeschooled. So have realistic expectations of yourself. Number four, have a routine, but hold it loosely. You want to have a plan, but remember that you're a family first. Things are going to happen. Then let's go back to vision. Think about what the world wants your child to learn. What are some of the state standards? Again, you don't have to go by these standards. These are just to give you a starting point to give you some milestones to evaluate. Are these things of value to us? What do we consider a good education for our child? And then also think about what it is that God wants your child to learn. And the last thing I want you to remember is life is still life. Life is messy. Your family is a work in progress. You know, homeschooling is going to bring out the imperfections in your family. It's not an instant fix. It's not a cure-all for everything that's wrong with your family. We have some family and parent resources on the site. Um, remember we talked about the survey earlier? I said that we took a survey of, of veteran homeschoolers, and one of the things they were afraid of was they're going to ruin their kids. And so... Um, you're not going to do everything right all the time. It's, it's just life. A lot of people think, if I homeschool my kids, everything's going to be hunky-dory. But, like I said before, it's like working at a new job. You're going to get better at it. You're going to find the rhythm for your family. You can do this. So, remember also that not all kids are thrilled to be homeschooled. Whether it's a mid-year decision, whether you started from the beginning, um, one of our girls, when she was about 14, I have her permission to tell the story. When she was about 14, um, she'd been a great student. In fact, she's the, she was the motivation for us to start homeschooling. She had asked us when she was younger to homeschool, tried it for a little bit, took a break. When she was in middle school, she asked again, and that's when we started for the long haul homeschooling, when she was in, um, had just finished fifth grade, I believe it was. And so she'd been homeschooled all along till she was 14 when this story uh I'm going to share with you. Great, great student. Typical overachieving firstborn. And we had a good relationship, and she was a good student, but she just had a rough year, and we lived in the, out in the middle of nowhere, didn't have as many opportunities as a lot of kids have now, and she had decided she was really unhappy with our decision. And she stood at the top of the stairs, and she hollered at me, I hate you, and I hate homeschooling, and I can't stand being cooped up in this house all day with seven kids. And I said, you seven, I'm in here with eight. And she said, well, when I'm 18, I am out of here. And when I grow up, I'm never doing this to my kids because you're ruining my life. And I just looked at her, and I said, honey, I am so sorry that you're not happy. But it's not my job to make you happy. It's my job to do what God's called me to do with you. And if Daddy and I did not believe 100% that we we're doing what God's called us to do with you. I'd put you back in school in a heartbeat because it would be a whole lot easier for me. But when you grow up, if you don't want to do this, you and your husband don't want to do this, that's between you and your husband and God. But Daddy and I are going to stand before God someday and answer for how we're raising you. And if we're making a mistake, we're making it as honestly as we know how. So I'm sorry. I love you. See you later. And she went and did her work, and she was a you know, great student, and like I said, overachiever, and did a fabulous job, and graduated from high school and uh, did not run off when she was 18. She waited till she was 20 and married a pastor. And uh, At some point later on, she sent us several thank you notes. I go into more detail in some of my other workshops, so I don't want to give you too much information here that you don't want to hear right now. But one of the, th the things she did was write me several thank you notes along the way. But she also had to write it. I didn't have to. She was asked to write an article on her homeschooling experience. And so I didn't get to see it till it was done. And her article was called, was printed in a national book, it was called, I Hated Homeschool. Here I speak on a national level, internationally, to homeschool families across the world, 
and my child writes an article called I Hated Homeschool. But you know, it was so powerful and so valuable because she talked about the fact that home, she says, homeschooling wasn't always what I wanted, but it was what I needed. And I'm so thankful for parents who knew the difference. You can read her story in the archives at HSLDA's Toddlers to Tweens newsletter. You can also read it on my website at uh, Everyday Homemaking. But I asked her what she would share with you if she could give you advice today. And she just went to Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now, she graduated as a homeschooler. She sent us a thank you note for sticking with homeschooling even through the rough times. And uh, I asked her once what she would think was the greatest benefit of homeschooling. And she said some of the greatest benefits to her were that she learned how to learn and that her heart was drawn back to God and her family. And you can read the rest of her story. But just to give you a little hint there, she now has five children. Guess what she does with them? Yep, she homeschools. She writes homeschool material. She writes a mommy blog. And her husband works in the homeschooling community as well. So whether you're, I just tell you that to give you some hope. So whether you're planning ahead or you're panic planning because you're try, trying to make a decision for tomorrow, or I like to call it homeschooling by surprise, hopefully this has given you kind of a bird's eye view here. This was an overview. Hopefully it gave you confidence that you can do this. If you want to go into more detail to equip you even further, I invite you to join us for our Home Education 101. It's a six-week mentoring program designed for maybe first or second year homeschoolers. Each of the six weekly modules contains several short, manageable lessons. We try to keep it to about 15 minutes at a time. It includes personal videos from me, workshop slides, handouts, worksheets, articles, access to weekly real-time Q&A interaction. We've got a Facebook community of folks that are starting this journey alongside you as well. So I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, we go through beginning your incredible journey and choosing curriculum, home educating with style. We talk about organizing your time and your home for learning. We go over testing and evaluations as well as some teaching tips because we just want to personally equip you and give you some one-on-one -on -one encouragement there. A lot of folks tell me it's such a bargain just to make wiser curriculum choices and to feel more confident in your homeschool journey. I have people who come through the class and afterwards they've told us, because this has been available in book format for several years, and they tell me, oh, I finished this, I feel so great, I want to come alongside another new homeschooler and help them get started like this. So you can find some testimonials on our page at courses.homeschoolwithconfidence.com. So if you're willing to invest just 15 or 20 minutes at a time for some more in-depth coaching and starting strong, choosing curriculum, lesson planning, managing your time, managing your home, assessing your child's progress, and those teaching tips. Sign up for today for our next session of Home Education 101. Now, it may be that you feel that you don't need any more help to feel equipped. You've got a handle on this. You're ready to jump right in. If you'd like to be part of our exclusive online membership community, we help each other succeed. Live sessions, discounts on my other workshops. We've got uh, guest uh, visitors on there, bonus downloads, a lot of goodies just for members. So I encourage you to visit us there at Homeschool with Confidence. I'm so excited for you. I just want you to enjoy this wonderful adventure. I hope this is helping you to homeschool with confidence because you can do this.